We'll invite you to turn in Luke 18 in your copy of God's Word this morning, Luke 18, where we'll continue in our study of Luke's Gospel. If you were with us last Lord's Day, you know that uh, in Luke 17, at the end of 17, uh, Jesus is teaching his disciples about his return. It's in response to a question he gets from uh, the Pharisees who were not trusting in Jesus as a Messiah, who were uh, essentially saying, you know, you're not him, but how are we going to know uh, when these things do come to fruition? And Jesus says, indeed, I am him. The kingdom is in your midst. And, and then he turns and teaches his disciples about what is to come. And in that, we addressed how so often we're, we're fascinated with trying to calculate times and events, and yet Jesus says uh, we need not do that because his return will be unmistakable. It will be global, and with it will come a sudden separation and judgment. And so the question before us is not trying to figure out when, it's figuring out are we ready? Are we ready for Christ? Return. That, that's the question that's not just before us in Luke 17, it's before us in Luke 18 and 19 and so on. It's the question we should be asking each and every Lord's Day. And yet for some of us, if we're honest, perhaps we find ourselves less ready today than we were last week. And perhaps this has been a hard week and a struggling week. And, and maybe just not a week, maybe a year or years where you are struggling to have hope. And so it's fitting then that as Jesus is talking about the, the, the days that are coming, hey, he also talks about the hopelessness we will face. In fact, before he teaches his disciples about his sudden return and his unmistakable return, the very first thing he says to them is there are going to be days when you are going to long to see the Son of Man and you will not see him. <laughs> And that day for the disciples would come, and that day for generations of disciples has come, and that day is here for us as well, because Christ has not returned yet. And there are days, especially days when we struggle, when we cry out, come Lord Jesus, come, and, and, and he hasn't come yet. So what do we do in those days? Well, Jesus is going to teach us this now. And this parable that we know is the, the parable of the persistent widow, a parable that I think often we take, like we do many of the parables, just out of context, and we isolate it on its own, and we, we dissect it, we try to figure out a lot of things from it, but it's, it's so helpful if we just consider when Jesus gave this parable, who he gave it to us, why he gave it to them, which he tells us at the beginning, and how it fits within the context of Jesus talking about these days when we would long for him to come and fix everything and make all things new, and yet we don't see those days yet, and we can struggle to have hope, and we can struggle to pray, and he gives us this word. And so I pray it'll be a word that encourages us today. And so with that introduction, I'm going to read for us Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, and if you're able to, I want to invite you to stand out of reverence to the word of God. This is what God's word says. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect, who cried to him day and night. Will he delay long over them? Tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith 
on earth. We will pray with you. That is the question for us today, Lord. When Jesus returns and when he comes, will he find faith on earth? Will he find faith in Bloomfield Baptist Church? Will he find faith in my life and in the lives of those who have gathered this morning? And will he find faith in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of times that that tempt us to feel hopeless in the midst of weariness and exhaustion. Father, help us in those times to have faith and and help us to learn from your word today more of who you are, who you've created us to be, what you've called us to do, and help us, Lord, not to lose sight of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ that saves us. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. A number of years ago, in fact, about 11 years ago, I found myself on a on a, a mission trip on a flight. And if you've flown internationally, you know that on these long flights, they often have uh, entertainment for you and, and movies you can look through and read through, uh, scroll through and I came across a movie I wasn't very familiar with. Uh, The title was All is Lost. Uh, It was a movie that starred Robert Redford. In fact, he was the only person in the close to two-hour movie. And if you've seen the movie, you know why. It's about uh, a man who is uh, in a a boat sailing in the Indian Ocean. His, His boat is struck by a stray shipping container that's floating out to sea. Uh, that punctures his boat. It begins to flood. And the next two hours of the movie basically chronicle uh, eight days of disaster. And the title of the movie is All is Lost, and that's essentially what the movie's about. Uh, this character, Robert Redford, in the movie, he, he, he tries all types of things to fix the situation. So uh, the boat is flooding, and as he tries to fix that, uh, his radio equipment is messed up, and he tries to fix that. He's able to hear a message that tropical storm is coming, and then that storm comes, and the boat capsizes, and then the boat sinks, and he gets in the life raft, and just one thing after another. His his water supply is tainted. He can't use it. He he, he fashions a, a hook and a line. He catches a fish, but on the way in, a, a shark eats it, and I mean, just over and over again, all is lost. Hey, he sees at one point ships in a distance, a far distance. He, he has a flare gun. He shoots it off. Uh, they don't see it. And he ends up using all his flares. And so finally, close to eight days later, when a ship is much closer and he can see the lights of it, he doesn't have a flare gun to shoot. And so in a container there on this little life raft, he fashions a little bit of a fire with pages from his journal trying to get their attention. It doesn't seem to work. The boat's moving further away. The lights are getting dimmer. He builds a big enough fire, hoping they might see it, and then the fire catches his raft on fire. It sounds like a great movie so far. I'm sure you're all going to go home and watch it. But again, the title kind of gives it away. All is lost. And in in the closing sequence in the movie, he jumps off his life raft that is burning, and he begins to sink down to the ocean floor. Now, I share that not to inspire you to go watch All Is Lost, but I share it because I remember 11 years ago watching that movie, considering some of the things that I was dealing with and our family was going through and thinking, you know, that, that, that's kind of how life feels sometimes. And it feels like we're just kind of drifting, and then disaster comes, and we feel alone, and we feel isolated, and there are times that we feel all is lost. And I'm not just talking about pre-redemptive times. I'm not just talking about in our unbelieving days before we knew Christ and we had the hopelessness of the burden of sin in our lives and and we were without hope and we found that hope in Jesus and we certainly do find hope in Jesus. I'm saying as a redeemed people, as Christians, as those who come to rightly understand the the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus proclaims, that, that, that Jesus indeed died on the cross 
for our sins and we put our trust in him and we're forgiven and we're cleansed and we're made new and we know what it is to have faith. I'm saying for, for people who've experienced all of that, that there are still waves of despair that come in our lives to the extent that we feel at times like we are drowning under. And there can be times that we, in our hopelessness, are tempted to give up, are tempted to feel that all is truly lost. And, and I believe it's, it's that context that Jesus is speaking of here, because, because in this passage, hey, he's just talked to his disciples about there's going to be this day that comes when you're going to long to see something you're not going to see. Hey, he just told them about his return and what's coming with his return and, and how judgment's coming and how righteousness is coming and how, how there's going to be this great separation and how that's great hope for the believer because when he returns, he makes all things right. And when he returns, he, he judges that which is not right. And this day is coming. And yet at the same time, Jesus says to them, but there's going to be days you, you long for this. And you're not going to see it. And, and they would long for it and not see it. And generation after generation after generation of believers have longed for it and not seen it. And it's in that context then that Jesus tells us, Luke says it this way, a parable to the effect that they, that we, ought always to pray and not lose heart. Why would Jesus give a parable about how we need to always pray and not lose heart because Jesus knows that there are times that we will not pray because we've lost heart, because we've lost hope. And so it's in this context then that he, he gives us this parable so that we might know what it is not to lose hope, that we might understand better why we should not lose hope, lose heart, and why we should indeed pray. And so that is the context of the parable, and we're going to look at it through looking at three points I put before you this morning, reasons why I believe Jesus is encouraging us not to lose heart. The first one is this. Don't lose heart. Don't lose hope, because God is not like the unjust judge. <laughs> the unjust judge, you, you know from this story, you have likely heard this parable a number of times, but again, Jesus tells us, verse 2, uh, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. Now, again, just as a, a reminder, uh, parables were stories that Jesus told uh, about earthly situations to, to make spiritual, eternal gospel points. Jesus was not looking at the local paper. He wasn't talking about a movie and saying, well, let me tell you how this real life event or this made up event. No, he, he is telling a, a story that he's sharing of, of his own. It's not a real event. In fact, oftentimes he shares it in a way that's, that's rather extreme and shocking so that they might learn what it is he's trying to teach them. And here he says something rather extreme and shocking because he talks about a judge who, one, did not fear God and, two, did not respect man. Now, in, in our day, we don't have to be in the judicial system to understand there are qualifications for somebody to be a judge that there are certain things that they should have accomplished and done in order to be put in that position. We might argue that this person's not a good judge and this person's a bad judge, but there's, there's a minimum standard. They, they can't be a judge unless they've done this. Well, the, the Hebrew culture in Jesus' day, in order for someone to be a judge, they needed to meet these qualifications, that they needed to fear God, that these were judges over God. People. They needed to understand the law of God. They needed to understand what God taught in the Shema in Deuteronomy 6. That they were to love God with all our heart. That they were to love the word of God. That we're to teach the word of God and his commandments to others. And so when Jesus says, well, there's a city and they had a judge. And this judge didn't fear God. There may have been an audible gasp among the disciples. What, what, do you, what do you mean, a judge who didn't fear God? And not just that, he, he didn't fear God, nor did he respect man. I mean, what does Jesus teach us? 
We're to love God and love others. What is true of this judge? He doesn't love God. He doesn't love others. So what does he love? He, he loves himself. And so it's this extreme example that Jesus gives to say, don't lose hope and always pray. So he starts it by saying, listen, there's, there's this judge. It wasn't a good judge. If you're attorney, an attorney and you're going to try a case, you, you don't want to go before this judge. He's not just. He's not fair. He's not good. And so Jesus says it is in that context, then, that there's a widow. And when we don't know her case, it's, it's not important. It's, it's a parable. It's not relevant to the point Jesus is making. All we know is that she has an adversary. That word means she has an accuser. That means there, there is a plaintiff. There is someone bringing a charge against her. She is the defendant. And apparently, when she goes before this judge, the judge is not giving justice. And so the indication here is that she is in the right, this accuser is in the wrong, and yet this unjust judge refuses to actually declare justice, to declare that she is in the right. And so, Jesus says, she just keeps coming back. And she comes back, and she comes back, and she comes back, and she comes back. She is persistent. Our kids learn, if nothing else from God's word growing up, to be a persistent widow. <laughs> we, we often would tell that joke in our house, is being the persistent widow. If you've got kids, you know that, that, that they know how to ask and ask and ask and ask and ask. You probably didn't sit down and teach them, you know, listen, uh, there's going to be a situation and we're going to be in Walmart and you're going to want something and I'm going to say no. So let's just take some time to go. But you just got to keep asking. You got to keep asking. You, you didn't need to teach that. They just do it over and over and over. And you know, my oldest is 25. They, at least till 25, they still do it. <laughs> it keeps going. And so this, this widow, she's, she just keeps going to the point that you've got this unjust judge. He doesn't fear God. He doesn't care about her. He doesn't care about justice. But verses 4 and 5, the judge says to himself, again, this is the extreme case. Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. He's exhausted. He's tired. He's bothered. He doesn't care about justice. doesn't care about the widow. He gives her justice. It just stops wearing him out. <laughs> so why is that a story that should help us to learn to continue to pray and not to lose heart. What? Why does Jesus use a picture of an unjust, ungodly, uncaring, wicked judge to tell us that we know need to continue to go before the Father in prayer? He tells us, verse six. The Lord says, "Hear what the unrighteous judge says." He says, listen, this guy doesn't care about God. He doesn't care about man. And even he, look at what he says. Now compare this, contrast this. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long over him? Yet Jesus is not giving us this parable to say, you know, when you keep praying, you're just bothering God. But if you bother God enough, he'll finally give in and give you what you're asking for. That, that is not the picture. That's the unjust judge. Jesus gives us this picture of this extreme, extreme judge who doesn't love God, doesn't love man, doesn't care about justice, who eventually gives justice in order that we might step back and say, and that's not what God is like. God's a good judge, and God's a good father, and God desires to give his children good things. God wants to answer our prayers. God desires for us to come before him. 
You, you couldn't have a greater contrast in all of Scripture than the unjust judge and our Heavenly Father. That's the picture Jesus is painting here. God is a good God. God wants to help us. God wants to answer us. Our, our earthly comparisons always fall short. Uh, our, our illustrations of, you know, because parents are this way towards their children, they, they always fall short. But let me just give you a picture that admittedly it falls short. If you're a parent and you're half decent, then you have probably had the experience where you were watching your child, your grandchild, your nephew, your niece, whoever, you're watching a child try to do something that you know they're not going to be able to do. That the, the box says, you know, ages 9 to 12, and grandma apparently can't read numbers and gives it to your two-year-old, and they're trying to fix it, and they can't do it, and they can't put A with B, and you're just watching, and, you know, you, you might not be an engineer, but you, you pass 9 to 12, you can figure this out, and you want to help them. But so often, what do they say? No. Me? Do it. And so you step back, and you watch them, they can't figure it out, and what you, you're, you're wanting them to say. Can, can you do it? Can you help me? You're, you're wanting to jump in there and just, just help them because you, you can, and you know they can. And sometimes they've got to wrestle with that for a long time before they surrender and say, okay, I, I, I need help here. Again, falls very short, but there's a picture. Our Heavenly Father can God help us our Heavenly Father desires for us to ask. Our Heavenly Father is a God of justice. It's in His very character. He cannot be unjust. He is just. The reason we have the cross of Jesus Christ is because God is just. The reason we have the opportunity for salvation through Christ's death for us is because God is a just God. And this picture couldn't be farther from who God is in order that we might see who God is. God is not like the unjust. He's not bothered by our prayers. And yet, in our times of despair and hopelessness, that's exactly what we are tempted to. We pray and we pray. And we ask, and we ask, and we plead, and we plead. And, and what it seems like to us at times, it's like we're just on a boat out in the middle of the ocean. Just sinking. And we don't get a response, and we don't get a fix, and we don't seem to get an answer, and, and, and we begin, we're at least tempted to think, we're bothering him. Jesus gives a picture here of a judge who's bothered to say, we're, we're, we're not bothered. He, he wants us to ask and ask. He, he tells us, pray without ceasing, pray without end. Keep asking, keep asking, keep asking. He invites us to it. Not so that he might eventually get worn out. <laughs> He's a righteous judge who longs to give justice to us. Jesus is telling us this so that we do not lose heart, so that we know better who he is, so that we know better who we are. Which brings us to the second observation here. We're, we're not to lose heart because we're not like the widow. God, God is not like the unjust judge, and, and we're not like the widow. Now, when you hear that, your very first thought might be, well, wait a second, I thought that was the whole point of the parable. Persistence, asking. Shouldn't the second point be, don't lose heart, be like the widow, be persistent like her? And yes, I would say, there's an application here that you should be persistent like her. But if you walk away from Luke 18 and the parable of the persistent widow, and your primary application is, God is not answering my prayer because I'm not praying it enough, and if I just pray it enough, he'll eventually answer it, that you've got the wrong application on this. Because that puts the entire focus on us. As if God is the puppet and we're pulling the strings. 
and we just need to manipulate them better. We need to do them a little bit more. We need some more practice to be a better puppet master here so God will eventually do what it is we're asking him to do. That's not the point of the parable. Should we be persistent? Yes. Pray without ceasing. Be persistent. But understand God's disposition towards you, who, who you are before God. It is not like the widow. God's not like the unjust judge. We're not like the widow. Widows in Jesus' day were among the most defenseless people in Hebrew society. You, you can read God's word from beginning to end. And, and what you find so often, uh, Malachi chapter 3, the widow was the oppressed. Uh, what you find, Exodus 22, is that the widow was the one getting taken advantage of. What you find in Isaiah 1, and I believe here in Luke 18, is that widows were often the legal victims because they were alone and they were defenseless. They had no advocate. They had no one on their side. They are often impoverished. They are often left without nothing. And in the Hebrew culture, when the husband was to pass, that, that widow did not receive all that was the husband's. It would pass to a male heir. And oftentimes in that system, the widow was left with little to nothing. And what little to nothing they had was often taken from them through legal means and through unjust legal means. And so when Jesus gives a picture of a widow going before a judge, that would not be an uncommon situation in his day because there were often widows going before the judge if they were even going to try to get justice. And so often justice was indeed denied to them. That's why, for example, we will see when we get to Luke chapter 20, that Jesus gives a sobering word about religious leaders in his day who he says were devouring the homes of of widows. They took advantage of them in every way they could. And so, understand this. When Jesus gives this picture of an unjust judge, he's not giving us a picture of who God truly is. And when he gives us a picture of this widow, he's not giving us a picture of who we are. Because notice who he says we are in verse 7. We are his but we're his chosen people. We are not alone. We are not isolated. We have been adopted in, brothers and sisters, to the family of God. God is our heavenly Father. Christ is our advocate, who is at the right hand of the Father in this moment now, who is praying for us and interceding for us. And when we are hopeless, and we don't even know how to pray, we have the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us. <laughs> that there couldn't be, again, a picture farther from who we are. We are not the widow out there by herself that nobody cares about and desperate and alone and desiring justice. No one wants to give it to us. We're daughters and sons of the King. We're the elect. The picture Jesus is giving here and when we, when we really get a, a grasp of that and consider what that means when it comes down to our access to the Father when we pray, it's amazing. Tim Keller, who's home with the Lord now, once said it this way, and I think of it often. He says, the only person who dares to wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. And we have that kind of access. We're not bothering God. We're not interrupting God. We're, we're certainly not wearing God out with our persistence. That God invites our persistence. And he asks us to pray. And I believe that that's the encouragement here is that Jesus is saying we, we, we go before a just God not because we are, we are bothering or we are going to wear him down eventually. We, we go before him because we know who we are. We know that we have an audience before him, not because of us, but because of the Son. And that through the Son, we can come to the Father. We're, we're not like the widow. We're not isolated. We're not alone. We're not out there sinking. We need to remember that when we're struggling to have hope. Because when we struggle to have hope, how do we feel? But we feel alone. And we feel isolated. And then we, we turn on the, 
religious channel on TV and some yahoos out there telling us to fake it till we make it. Believe and you'll receive. I haven't received anything. Maybe the problem is me. The problem is, is it turn that thing off. Open up the word of God. And see what Jesus says. The context. He, he tells us what the parable is about before he tells us the parable. He tells them this parable to the effect they ought always to pray and not lose heart. And so we're going to struggle with losing heart. We're going to struggle with being hopeless. And so then we open up the word and we read that, that, that Christ, who at this moment is on his way to Jerusalem to die on the cross for us, and even as he's preparing for that, he is saying to us, now listen, listen, you're, you're going to get to a point sometimes where it's going to feel like the bottom has dropped out and, and the lights are off and, and everything's falling apart. And the more you try to fix it, the worse it gets and you, you feel like everything's lost. And it's not. It's not. Don't lose hope. Pray and continue to pray. But, but if we if we just see this as a lesson on persistence, and the problem is we're not persistent. And then it's all about us. And then, then we turn the gospel of Jesus into a formula and well, if A plus B equals C, then, then you know me and my need plus persistence is going to equal an answer. And then the day comes when what happens? We long to see Christ do something we ask, and it is not occurring yet, and we then lose. And how, how many people have, have left the faith, have left this church and many others, and, and, and if they're honest enough to say it, will say to you, well, everything was good until, and, and then some devastating Suffering comes in their life, and, and that, that, that formula that they had somehow come up with along the way that so many of us do is if I just equal this, if I just do this, and I take it, keep up my end of the bargain, and God's going to do this, and everything's going to be fine, and then everything's not fine. Well, I've done my part. God didn't do his part. I'm out. Jesus says here, God always does. <laughs> always. In fact, as, as much as I like that quote by Keller, who says the only person who dares wake up the king at 3 a.m., ask for a glass of water as a child, where it falls short is this, our king never sleeps. Hear, hear this word. Maybe you have had the experience that I have had, and so many of you have had, because you tell me you've had it, where you are wrestling with something and anxious about something, and you're just lying there at night, and you can't, you can't turn it off. Open up your Bible when that happens. And turn to Psalm 129. And hear what God's word teaches us about who God is and who we are. Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My persistence? No. <laughs> my faithfulness? No. Verse 2, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is the shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. Go to sleep because he does. And in those moments when it's all that anxiety and all that worry and all this, well, if I just do this, maybe I can do this, maybe I can do this, stop and realize you're not God. And I'm not God. God needs no sleep. We need to go to bed. And part of us going to bed is simply acknowledging, God, you are God and I am not. Help me to rest in that truth, man. He is not the unjust judge. We are not the widow. Therefore, do not lose heart. He 
the concluding point is this. We don't lose heart because Jesus is coming to make all things new. Some things, friends, will not be made right until Jesus comes back. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't pray and that you shouldn't be persistent in prayer, that there are some wrongs in this world, in your life, in my life, there are some effects of the fall that are so devastating, they cannot be just wiped out in a race, but one day they will be wiped out in a race, and that day will be the day Jesus returns. And I think that's where Jesus is, is bringing us right back to. Again, what's the context? I'm coming back. It's going to be unmistakable. And what does he say about it? it it's going to be soon. And then he says here, God will give justice to us speedily. And then we wrestle with what the disciples in the first century wrestled with. Was, Wait a second. Jesus says he's coming back soon. Jesus says he's given justice speedily. This doesn't feel speedily. I mean, maybe that's not a word you use often. Speedily. You can pretty much guess what he's saying there. At least infer from that. Quickly, we like things to happen quickly, don't we? I was getting uh, one of the far while fleet of cars service this week. It's my second of three appointments in seven days with vehicles. And I remember as I, as I was checking out at the service department, uh, there was a there was a, a guy training. The, the guy who was new, and uh, I, I give him my card to make payment, and he takes out the machine, and the guy who's the trainer says, now listen, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you ahead of time, this thing takes 100 years. That's, that's bad, 100 years. It took like 10 seconds. You know, this guy's like seven years old, and I'm wanting to tell him, man, do you realize there was this day that they had to pull out like a paper cutter size thing and you know you put your card in or, and then, you know sometimes they had to go get a guy who worked out he's running that thing across it and there's like a carbon copy and some of y'all don't even know what your life is so easy but this, this was what we lived through but to tell him that story would have taken you know, 400 years in his timetable and we just want it fast that's too, i'm sitting in that waiting room for the car to get worked on. I brought a computer so I could do work. And, and this was the conversation I overheard among everybody. they come out and they'd say, well, here's what needs to be done. And before they would even ask, how much does it cost? You know what people say? How long is it going to take? How long is it going to take? I got to get here. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. And, well, how long is it going to take? And so we come to a passage like this, and Jesus says he'll give justice to us. Speedily, we're like, that's great, because, you know, I got 10 minutes for you, Jesus. I, that'd be good right now. Do it quickly. It might help you to know that that word speedily is also translated soon. And in Revelation 22, verse 7, Jesus says, And behold, I am coming soon. And it's the same word. What, what did we read last week? I think it was in 1 Peter. To the Lord, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. This side of eternity, it might not feel soon. One day it's going to feel soon. And it's going to be soon. And in God's timetable, we've said this before, he, he doesn't always come when we want him, but, but he's, he's always on time. And, and I think principally what you find in this parable and in so many other teachings on prayer is one of the fundamentals of prayer is what God is doing in our lives through prayer is, is he is bending our will to align with his will so that we too might pray what our Lord Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. And, and that will may not be on our demands and our timetable, but, but his will will come to fruition one day. Which you know, he, he wraps all this up in. He says, when that day comes, verse 8, will the Son of Man find faith on earth? Will he find faith on earth? Will, will he find us 
faithful instead of faithless. When we're, we're kind of hopeful instead of hopeless. But when he's kind of prayerful instead of prayerful. You saw the two hour guy sinking in a boat movie. You know how it ends? The character watching his life raft on fire. He is given up and is exhausted. He is sinking. And in the final seconds, he sees the outline of a boat. He sees a light flashing in the water. And he starts to swim towards the light. And as he gets closer to the light, his countenance changes because he sees a hand reaching down. And the, the movie ends with that hand grabbing his hand and pulling him up. And suddenly, the screen is white. when I think about what God says to us in our hopelessness, I think about this and I leave you with it. Look towards the light and the light is Christ. Don't look towards yourself and think, well, if I just do this more and I just do this better and I just have more of this and I just have more of this. Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of faith and how he will keep every promise he ever made. And he indeed is tender. And he is tender. And may we be so faithful. We would stand together if you're able, and I want to pray for this for that evening. Father, when Christ returns, what will he find? Help us to consider that this morning. In fact, Lord, I, I pray you would help every one of us during this time of response to consider this question. If Christ returns today, what will he find in our lives? Will he find hope? Will he find faith? Will he find repentance? Or will he find faithlessness? And hopelessness and a life of unrepentance. So often we're tempted to think about the return of Christ as this thing that's coming out there someday down the road, maybe not even in my lifetime, but Lord, the whole point of readiness is to be ready. And in your grace and in your goodness and in your providence, you have given us this moment on this Lord's Day that we might ask the question, are we ready? And if in the honesty and truthfulness of our hearts we find that we are not, then Lord, help us to be. And you tell us how to be. You tell us if we confess our sins that you're faithful, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then you tell us to come to you all who are weary and that you'll give us rest. You tell us that if we ask anything according to your will, you hear us and you answer us. You invite us to come. You are not an unjust judge. And we are not a desolate widow. We're children of the king. Unless we're not. And the Father, there's any here gathered with us this morning who's yet to come into your eternal family through repenting of their sin and confessing Christ as their Lord. And I pray that today would indeed be the day of salvation for them. And for those who have indeed been saved and yet today are struggling with hopelessness and the devastation in their lives, Lord, I pray that you would encourage them now to have hope, press on, and to look to the light which is Christ. And we ask that as we respond to your word now, in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, we're going to lift our voices and respond.